everyone. Welcome to this presentation on the metaphysics of property and exchange. Here's a brief overview of what we're going to do after a brief introduction on the on the topic of this presentation. I'll present the standard theory of exchange and then the modified action theory of exchange as developed and proposed by Marcel Tiefenbach. Then I'll argue that it's actually all about rights and present my own dispositional theory of exchange. So by way of introduction, this paper is uh, strongly based upon and, and a reaction to uh, the paper by Emma Saint Tiefenbach in 2017, The Metaphysics of Economic Exchanges, wherein they asked a very basic and interesting question, what uh, happens, what man happens metaphysically at the moment of an economic exchange? What is the, let's say, fundamental nature? What is the mode of being of an exchange? What really happens when we exchange something in the economic sphere? But they say that most economists uh, implicitly assume the standard theory of exchange. And what happens in the standard theory of exchange is that you have two persons uh, who have an inverse valuation of goods. Um, so you say you have uh, Julie who has a bike and Paul who has a violin. Um, Julie actually values Paul's violin more than her own bike and Paul values Julie's bike more than his own violin. So you have an inverse valuation of goods and hence the goods are uh, transferred. That's the standard uh, theory of exchange. But they say there are some problems with this standard theory of exchange, uh, most notably with um, episodic goods like services and non-depletable goods uh, like knowledge. Uh, they have other arguments as well, but I'm focusing on these, uh, these two arguments. Um, in both cases, you have what I'll call the transfer problem and the adverse valuation problem. So the standard theory of exchange works very well for, uh, for goods, for transfer of goods, but in the case of services, uh, episodic goods in general, but services uh, in particular, you have the transfer problem, I quote, if Julie sells a biking lesson to Paul, it is not the case that there was a biking lesson that she had in the first place, and it now belongs to Paul, end quote. Uh, so indeed, if uh, she has a bike, she first had the bike, she transfers, the bike to Paul now she no longer has uh, the bike but that's not the case uh, if you have if she's if, if Julie is selling uh, services uh, she didn't have a biking lesson to begin with and it's also not that she really lost um, uh, sorry the the biking lesson after afterwards moreover and linked to that you have the inverse valuation problem quote is it at all plausible to say that when Julie sells a biking lesson to Paul she prefers Paul's money to a biking lesson, end quote. It's actually linked to the, to the transfer problem um, since she doesn't really have to give up something that she previously had. It, it sounds strange, awkward uh, to say that she valued uh, the money more than a biking lesson so she, that she had to give up the biking lesson. She gave it to Paul because she valued it less than Paul's money. Uh, the same problems, the same counter arguments can be used in the case of non-depletable goods like uh, like knowledge, like the sharing of knowledge. And of course, you could say that um, there's actually a strong similarity between services and non-depletable goods like knowledge, because services, rendering a service to someone is based on a, on a capacity you have, like the capacity to uh, to play the violin or the capacity to, to ride a bike. So you can, uh, you can perform uh, services based on a capacity capacity itself is non depletable in, in most cases you don't destroy you don't lose capacity by rendering the service uh, by rendering the service and the same thing holds for non depletable goods like knowledge they can be seen as a kind of service that you give to the one receiving it uh, so there you have the transfer problem i quote if julie shares some of her knowledge to paul in exchange for some money she has not lost any of her knowledge once the exchange has taken place end quote uh, so it's very similar to the uh, to the transfer problem in the case of services. Um, even though you indeed, in a certain sense, give something, Julie, in a certain sense, gives something to Paul, but she doesn't really uh, lose it. She doesn't lose her knowledge. Uh, and related to that, you have again the inverse valuation problem. I quote: Is it at all plausible to say that when Julie shares her knowledge of the ontic logic with Paul against some money, she values her knowledge less than she values Paul's money? So on the standard theory of exchange, you need the inverse valuation. You value that which you give up less than that which you receive. But that's uh, strange in the case of knowledge because you 
you can give knowledge, but don't really lose the knowledge uh, you have given. So they propose instead the action theory of exchange. Um, in the action theory of exchange, there is, of course, a focus on actions instead of goods. So you have uh, Julie giving a, a violin concerto and Paul giving a, a lesson in deontic logic. Um, and the, uh, the action theory of change is propositional rather than objectional in the sense that the focus is not on goods uh, like objects that are being exchanged, but that um, both of them prefer not a certain good to another good, but prefer a certain state of affairs wherein uh, the, 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 the violent concerto is being uh, played and the, uh, the lesson of the antic logic uh, is being given as opposed to the state of affairs wherein that is not the case. Um, so another difference with the standard theory of exchange is that the action theory of, of exchange is, uh, works with converging valuations rather than inverse valuations. Both Julie and Paul prefer the state of affairs wherein the, uh, the violent concerto is being played and the lesson in the ontic logic uh, has been given uh, over and above the state of affairs in which that uh, wouldn't be the case. And of course, uh, the transfer problem and the inverse valuation problem in the case of services um, of the, the sharing of knowledge uh, doesn't hold for the action theory of exchange. But I submit there are problems with the action theory of exchange as well. Um, first of all, Massin Tiefen by themselves state that, I quote, we need one overarching concept of exchange, which subsumes goods for goods, services for services, and service for goods exchanges, end quote. And I fully agree with that. We need indeed an overarching concept to counter all kinds of exchanges. Um, but the problem with the action theory of exchange is that it is indeed very well fitted to deal with uh, services, with the rendering or providing of services, uh, but it's less well suited to deal with the exchange of goods. And so what Marcel and Tiefenbach uh, propose is to deal with the exchange of goods um, by calling the transfer of ownership of goods a kind of action. So they, uh, they subsume the, 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 the category of exchanging goods uh, under the, the, the general category of an action with which their action theory of exchange uh, deals, uh, deals very well. But I think that's, uh, that's confusing um, because it inserts an extra layer of description, namely a layer of description using uh, legal terms, the ownership of goods, and you are exchanging or transferring the ownership of goods and calling that a kind of action. Of course, playing violin and giving a lesson in young technologic is a is a real uh, action, and you're not you're not using any legal terminology to describe it. But if you are using legal terminology like ownership to describe the the exchange of goods, you have introduced an uh, an asymmetry into your model for the, for the metaphysics of exchange. On the other hand, um, I think their uh, suggestion that we need to take into account the ownership of goods is actually a very valuable one, but I think we should uh, extend it to services as well. Uh, and I'm referring to the, here to the famous uh, institutional economist Commons, who argued in a, in a very old, but very influential paper, quote, the so-called exchange of money, materials or services is not an exchange of physical products or material services, like playing the violin, as assumed by the classical and hedonistic economists. It is two transfers of two ownerships, from Julie to Paul and from Paul to Julie. The physical delivery occurs after the ownership is transferred, end quote. And in the same paper, next page, quote, what we buy and sell is not material things and services, but ownership of materials and services, end quote. So what I propose to do is to uh, follow the suggestion by Marcel Tiefenbach that we should talk about the transfer of the ownership of goods, but following common say that it's not just the ownership of goods, but it's the ownership of services as well. And that in that way, we have a perfectly generic and overarching concept 
to deal with exchanges of either goods or services. Namely, we're exchanging rights over goods, rights over services, even rights over money uh, against each other. So what we keep from the action theory of a change is that we have convergent preferences for a state of affairs after the exchange over the alternative state of affairs in which the exchange would not have taken place. So we have convergent uh, preferences um, which we take from the action theory uh, of exchange. However, if we are introducing rights uh, into our metaphysics of exchange, uh, property rights in particular, but it can apply to any kind of rights, the question arises, of course, what the fundamental nature and mode of being, the metaphysical question by excellence of these rights, obligations and institutions are, or otherwise our metaphysics of exchange wouldn't be really uh, enlightening. And there I propose my own uh, dispositional theory of exchange, uh, which is based on the notion of action possibilities. I have uh, introduced that account elsewhere in a paper, uh, in a 2017 paper, all the institutions as institutions as dispositions, uh, plugging my own uh, research here a bit, wherein I argue that the fundamental nature of rights and institutions in general um, can be captured within metaphysics of powers or dispositions. But these powers or dispositions are actually action pass action possibilities. Uh, they are rooted in um, a standard libertarian conception of the principle of alternative possibilities by which we are always at uh, a choice point at any point in time. Uh, there's an entire uh, range of alternative actions we could do instead, or at least we could start uh, doing uh, instead. This implies that there's actually an entire universe, uh, counterfactual universe of states of affairs that we could uh, actualize and we could make manifest if you would choose uh, to do so. Uh, of course, we can always uh, only actualize one of them, but it doesn't diminish the reality of the possibility of doing or starting to do anything else. And what rights then do is carve out spaces, so to speak, within that universe of alter of uh, states of possible states of affairs, um, spaces that are exclusively accessible to particular persons. So, in a simple case of property rights, like over the laptop that I'm using right now, uh, the the set or the space of states of affairs involving the use of my laptop is exclusively accessible to me. Um, I could do lots of things with my laptop. There's an entire uh, space of states of affairs that I could uh, make manifest by using my laptop, but it's only it's exclusively accessible uh, to me. This actually ties into what Commons uh, himself writes, um, quote, legal control the kind of control you acquire by transferring rights is future physical controls. That's, that's, that's his emphasis. And the only thing I would modify there is, is that physical control is the most, not the most metaphysically precise description. It's, uh, it's possible control, having the, the, the possibility of controlling a certain uh, good uh, in this case. There is, however, an important difference between rights over goods and rights over services, in the sense that rights over goods are negative rights against other persons, but you should say this object is exclusively accessible to me. Only I can uh, make manifest the states of affairs that are involving this particular object. Whereas rights over services are rights over, over uh, other persons, by which you can say that the other person uh, doesn't have to refrain from a certain space of uh, states of affairs, but that he has to make manifest that he has to realize a certain state of affairs. For example, Julie playing the violin concerto or Paul giving the lesson in the ontic logic. Uh, accepting an institution like the entire, entire institutional framework or framework of private pro property um, implies that uh, one nils to manifest all the non-accessible states of affairs. So one, one, one uh, 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 nils, uh, is wills not to make manifest any uh, state of affairs or to use the, uh, uh, the analogy I have used above, that the one does not enter any space that is exclusively accessible to, uh, to other persons, uh, to, to, to someone else. Um, 
this is actually uh, based, grounded upon um, a notion of intra-personal uh, exchange, which I get from our economist again, Ludwig von Mises in his Human Action, where he describes all of human action as an exchange, but an exchange first and foremost uh, for uh, the person, him or herself. Quote, action, any action it is, action is an attempt to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory one. We can also to willfully induce alteration and exchange. A less desirable condition is a barter for a more desirable one. The gratifies less is abandoned in order to obtain something that pleases more. That which is abandoned is called a price paid for attainment of the end sold." Uh, end quote. Um, so the way I am uh, interpreting or using that idea here is to say that um, we are always choosing the fact that we are always at a choice point implies that we are always exchanging uh, another possible state of affairs we could have realized for the one uh, we do re realize and that this notion of exchange that any person is is performing with the the range of uh, al uh, alternative possibilities that he or she has opened to him uh, is the root of interpersonal exchange so if you look at the the, the standard theory of exchange again and the fact that uh, in the case of services, of rendering services, uh, there didn't seem to be uh, any notion of having to give up something. So Julie giving a violin lesson, uh, it's not that she had to give up the violin lesson, but if you look at it from this perspective, you say that, well, the, the, the foregone alternative possibilities is what she had to give up. So it's not that she valued the, the, the violin lesson uh, less than Paul's money, is that she valued the the alternative state of affairs that she could have done instead of giving the violin lesson or giving a violin concerto is what she valued less because that is what she had to give up that's what she had to uh, abandon so in that sense uh, we can see that um, this uh, this notion of uh, foregone alternative possibilities lies indeed at the heart of uh, interpersonal exchange as well one final uh, advantage i think of the dispositional theory of exchange is um, the case of exchanges made for pleasure. Um, it's an argument against the standard theory of exchange advanced by Massant even by because in, in that case, you don't have an inverse uh, valuation of preferences. People just exchange for pleasure. Uh, but it's of course also an argument that backfires against their own action theory of exchange. Uh, and they, they, they modify, they make their own action theory of exchange even more complex in order to, to deal with it in the case of the exchange of goods. Um, but I think that uh, we need not do so that the, my own dispositional theory, theory of exchange uh, abstracts from uh, the motivations that are involved in exchanges made, whether one really wants to acquire the other good or really wants the service to be performed rather than simply exchanging for pleasure, uh, doesn't really matter. Ultimately, it is one state of affairs that is being exchanged against another, uh, sorry, another uh, state of affairs and the motivations for these exchanges can be anything. They can have to do with uh, the, the goods that themselves that are being exchanged. They can uh, have to do with the um, with the services that one really wants, or they can be anything else in the state of affairs um, that one is actualizing uh, compared to the one that uh, would have become actual instead. Um, and to illustrate this point, um, I want to make a brief final reference to the old uh, classic 1996 movie phenomenon in which uh, George played by John Travolta is buying uh, Lace's chairs um, so uh, no one else wants to buy these chairs but George is interested uh, in Lace he wants to uh, well let's see I, I won't I won't spoil the movie for you it's a good movie go watch it after this presentation um, so he's interested in Lace and he he buys her chairs so he's not really interested in the chairs he's interested in a state of affairs wherein the chairs are being bought. Um, and why? Because he wants uh, to realize that state of affairs because he wants to make Lace uh, happy and self-confident and what have you not. And I think that this kind of exchange is uh, just that, uh, just as valid and has to be able to be captured by a metaphysics of exchange just as much as uh, purely economic exchange, so to speak. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>